Okay. Welcome everybody to today's webinar um, entitled Advanced Care Planning in Older Adults with Multiple Chronic Conditions Undergoing Surgery. This webinar series is coordinated by the Aging Initiative, which is an NIA-funded initiative that bridges the expertise and leadership of two powerhouses for research on multiple chronic conditions. The two powerhouses are the Healthcare Systems Research Network and the Claudia Pepper Older Americans Independent Centers, or PEPPER Centers. The Aging Initiative the initiative is led by Dr. Jerry Gerwitz at the University of Massachusetts and Myers Primary Care Institute, along with the co-PIs Elizabeth Bayless and a Magaziner. My name is Tilka Garg, and I'm a urologic oncologist and clinical investigator at Geisinger Health System, and I am part of the Aging Initiative Dissemination Work Group, which is led by Heather Whitson at the Duke University Pepper Center and Leah Hansen at Health Partners. Before we get started, I do need to cover a few technical details. Due to the number of registrants for today's webinar, we have placed phone lines on mute to reduce audio feedback. So unless you are logged in as a host or panelist, your line is muted. However, do welcome and encourage audience participation using the Q&A or chat features of the webinar software. If you're in your Cisco webinar portal under the tab that says Presentation, and you look to the upper right, you see an icon for chat and an icon for Q&A. If you have questions for our speakers, please use the Q&A function to submit your questions. Leah and I will keep an eye out. Uh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Her and I will keep an eye out for those questions with the Q&A icon. As time permits, we will read questions for our speaker after the presentation. And if technical or logistical questions, we ask that you submit those using the chat function. If you are identified by either your name or participant ID so our webinar hosts will be able to help troubleshoot any problems that you're having with audio or other issues. The chat function, you can choose whether you would like your comment to be visible to all participants, or you can choose to send the question only to hosts. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to Catherine Anzoni and Valentina Boulay at the Myers Primary Care Institute who do amazing work behind the scenes to make these webinars possible. They're monitoring the chat functions today to help with technical troubleshooting. Now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our two speakers. Our first speaker is Victoria Tang. Um, she is a geriatrician and clinician and researcher at UCSF dedicated to improving the care of older adults undergoing high-risk surgery. She completed her medical training at the University of Texas Southwestern a V Quality Scholars Fellowship and an NIH T32 Research Fellowship, during which time she completed a master's in clinical research with specialization in implementation science at UCSF. As co founder and director of the Surgery Wellness Clinic at UCSF, she incorporates advanced care planning with routine preoperative care, especially for older adults with multimorbidity. Her research interests include advanced care planning, decision making, and geriatric surgical care. Her second speaker is Zara Cooper. Zara um, Cooper is an acute care surgeon, trauma surgeon, and surgical intensivist at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. She is an associate professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School, associate chair of faculty development for the Department of Surgery and Deputy Director of Strategic Planning and Partnerships at the Center for Surgery and Public Health at Brigham and Women's. She's a graduate of the Mount Sinai School of Medicine and completed her general surgery residency and, and critical care fellowship at Brigham and Women's, trauma fellowship at Harborview Medical Center and the University of Washington in Seattle, and training in hospice and palliative medicine at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Brigham and Women's. Cooper's research aims to improve palliative and geriatric care for older, seriously ill surgical patients. A a leader in surgical palliative care and geriatric trauma, she has authored over 80 peer-reviewed manuscripts, chapters, and abstracts, and lectures nationally about surgical care in complex older patients. Dr. Cooper is currently funded through the NIA Paul B. Beeson Leadership in Aging Award, the Kibia Foundation Sojourn Scholarship, and is a co-investigator on multiple federal funded grants. She is chair of the Prevention Committee for the American Association of the Surgery of Trauma and serves on the Geriatrics Task Force and the Native Care Committee for the American College of Surgeons. 
ahead and um, start with Dr. Tang's presentation. Dr. Tang, you should be able to share your screen now. Yourself. Go ahead and mute you. Hi. Um, Does that look up? Yep. Great. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, so I, uh, I'd like to start by uh, sincerely thanking the Aging Initiative Network for supporting this project that I'll be presenting. Um, through the mentorship, guidance, and support, this uh, study and collaboration um, was very fruitful, so I definitely appreciate that. Um, additionally, thanks to the UCSF Pepper Center and the Palo Alto Medical Foundation, uh, which is part of the HCSRN um, group, and my great appreciation to the uh, Palo Alto Medical Foundation collaborators and my mentors at the Pepper Center. Let's see. We know a lot of older people undergo surgery. 19.2 um, million operations occur in patients 65 and older in a year, and they make up about 38% of the surgical population. Of operations that occur in older adults, over 4 million are high risk, which is 20% of the type of operations older adults undergo. And what I mean by high risk is that the operation is associated with a greater than 1% likelihood of a 30-day or in-hospital post-op mortality. And examples of such operations include lung section, pancreatic resection, and um, esophagectomy. And so as our population's number of older adults increase, the uh, number of older adults undergoing high-risk surgery is actually expected to grow to 14 million by 2030. Older adults are at high risk of suffering complications, uh, worsening in their quality of life, and higher risk of death, so that over one in five will experience a life-altering complication. These complications may precipitate a loss to loss of physical function and independence. And so in this bar chart I have down below, um, the y-axis is percent mortality, and on the x-axis are three different types of high-risk operations. Um, and then you can see that the light gray bars represent the young old, uh, which is in the range of 65 to 69 years of age. And the black bar are those 80 plus years of age. And so with increasing age, the operative mortality increases for all three of these high-risk operations. And so in older adults with multiple chronic conditions, or MCC um, for sure, they're especially at high risk for post-operative morbidity and mortality. So the hood of poor outcomes in this population, the American College of Surgeons and American Geriatric Society came together to develop best practice guidelines for the care of the geriatric surgical patient. And so within these guidelines, they actually recommend advanced care planning to occur in the preoperative setting. And additionally, the Coalition for Quality and Geriatric Surgery, um, which has been tasked to find geriatric surgical standards and healthcare systems through the U.S. to implement them, um, they've also stated that advanced care planning must occur with patients prior to surgery. So planning look like in surgery? Um, so Dr. Zara Cooper will go into detail what those conversations should look like in the surgical setting, but let me just um, give you an example. So Mr. D is an 86-year-old man with CD, mild dementia, and a bile duct tumor that has caused him to have multiple hospitalizations um, for recurring cholangitis. So on his last hospitalization, the surgery was offered and he was referred to the surgery wellness clinic. 
And so the Surgery and Wellness Clinic is an interdisciplinary uh, pre-op program we've built at UCSF um, for patients just like uh, Mr. D. So at the time that I saw him, Mr. D and his family were concerned. They didn't know how to think about the decision. And so we discussed um, what's most important to him in his life, his goals and values, and what surgery means within this context. If a patient and family had decided to proceed with surgery, and I actually didn't hear from them until several months after, in which um, his patient, uh, the patient's family had informed me that the patient had post-op complications and functional decline. He was in a skilled nursing facility, um, but that they were so thankful that we had this advanced care planning discussion because they felt that they were prepared to make decisions throughout the hospital course. Um, uh, with all these complications, um, and so they were really thankful that they were engaged in advanced care planning prior to surgery. So the kind of advanced care planning needs to occur with every older adult with multiple chronic conditions, and the ultimate goal for me is to improve preoperative ACP rates and documentation to start off. With. So the pilot project objectives um, were to characterize the prevalence of ACP and the patient characteristics associated with this documentation in older adults with multiple chronic conditions prior to undergoing a high-risk surgery. Basically, we wanted to know how many who were likely to have an advanced care plan prior to surgery. We wanted to describe the content of the ACP discussion in older adults uh, with MCC who died within a year of their high-risk surgery. So this is a group that absolutely should have had some sort of ACP discussion. So in answer to the question of how many and who, uh, we used a secondary data analysis method. And to answer the question of what is the ACP content documented, we used mixed methods. Our data source was the Palo Alto Medical Foundation Electronic Health Record. And just to describe PAMP a little bit, it's a large uh, multi-specialty ambulatory care system that serves Northern uh, California. And the data we used was collected between January 1st, 2013 to December 31st, 2014. Our cohort by first identifying those active in PAMP between 2013 to 2014, and then we narrowed it down to our population of interest, which was 65 years and older. Um, because we were interested in looking at those with multiple conditions, we identified them through Charleston comorbidity score of greater than one. And then lastly, we only included those with evidence of having a high risk of surgery. Measures of interest are patient demographics, which include age, sex, race, language, and marriage status, and clinical data, which included uh, medical comorbidities and the severity, as well as the type of high risk surgery they underwent. Our outreach was ACP documentation in the electronic health record. This included documentation of the Advanced Healthcare Directive, or POLST. We analyzed our data with the logistic regression modeling. And through the question of what was in the ACP documentation, we randomly selected 25 patients within our cohort that had died within a year of their high-risk surgery to chart review. And looked at the progress notes and the scanned legal documents, and of interest were the ACP topics discussed in the progress notes. So examples of this were patient goals and views or the identification of a surrogate decision maker. And then on, additionally, we identified the healthcare provider that docu documented the ACP discussion and, and the discussion uh, took place. consisted of 393 patients and were primarily elderly, with 42% being between the age of 75 to 84, um, the mean of 70 years, um, mostly, mostly made up of uh, 
uh, that were white, uh, that's 74%, then 92% were English speaking. Six of our cohort had eight or more office visits within the year prior to surgery. 31% had at least one serious illness, uh, such as brain cancer, and 65% had a Charles and comorbidity score of three or more, indicating that our cohort was sick, had a high comorbidity burden, and had high health care needs. So within 68% underwent a surgery associated with uh, greater than 5% risk of dying within 30 days of the surgery or during the hospitalization. So uh, breaking down um, the type of surgery that um, our patients underwent, so 54% underwent a cardiothoracic surgery, while 23% who underwent a gastrointestinal um, operation. Despite the high risk of poor outcomes, only 26% of her cohort had ACP documented prior to surgery. More likely to have ACP prior to surgery were those that were older and white. So you see here that the um, odds ratio of uh, those 85 and older were two um, with an 85% confidence interval of one to four. Additional number of office visits a year prior to surgery and the presence of cognitive impairment prior to surgery. And you can see the odds ratios for that. Um, those that had eight or more office visits one year prior had an odds ratio of 18.5 um, with a range of five to 67.8 for their confidence interval. Um, one thing to point out is that we found no association with sex, language, marital status, insurance type, or serious illness at time of surgery. In the 25 charts we reviewed, and this was of the um, 37 who died within a year of their surgery, 12 patients had some evidence of advanced care planning in the progress notes or a legal document scanned in within a year prior to surgery. And this equaled 23 notes in total that we had. Um, so five patients had legal documentation, two with both, two with DPOA, and one with an advanced health care directive. Some were documented by an internal medicine provider, followed by six, which was by a palliative care provider, and four by a cardiology provider. And most of the advanced care planning um, uh, decisions look like they occurred in a clinic setting. Frequently mentioned ACP topics were the presence of a legal document or form. And, it, and an example of this is the quote, has a DPOA for healthcare at home and asked to provide me with a copy. I have given a copy of, of Pulse form. This is documentation of code status. For example, the patient is full code. The third frequent is goals of care. And an example of this is a quote, to avoid hospitalizations, stay at home, comfort. She expressed a wish to go home to Columbia to die, but understands this probably will not happen. And lastly, identification of a surrogate. Directive on file, no code. Daughter is DPAHC, holds done filed. The 12 patients had a note in their chart mentioning a discussion of advanced care planning. There was no uh, indication of the topic discussed or the patient's preferences of um, how they'd like to make decisions. So an example of this is a quote, and life issues discussed. I'm willing to follow patients' wishes as stated in the advanced directive if available. Conclusion, um, 
um, the news is that in older adults with MCC who had a high-risk operation, only 26% had accessible AC documentation, and, and um, non-patients were least likely to have this documentation. The good news is that older patients with a greater number of office visits in the year prior to surgery and those with cognitive impairment were more likely to have ACP documentation. Dive into the chart, we found that ACP documentation in those that died within a year of surgery included code status and legal documentation. And for those with a goals of care discussion, few documented the details. We found that ACP documentation were more likely from internal medicine and palliative care providers. It occurred usually in a clinic setting. This, what to do about the low numbers and the lack of ACP detailed documentation. Um, we can incorporate ACP in the preoperative workflow, just like we do with a CRAC or a plenary evaluation and require documentation of a patient's goals of care and values. And it can look different at each institution. Um, in San Francisco, we do this at the Surgery Wellness Clinic, um, which again is a geriatric specific pre-op clinic. And at the VA, we do it in an interdisciplinary pre-op clinic that's for everyone. Um, and additionally, we can think about engaging the stakeholders and have patients, providers such as PCP, as well as surgeons proactively take part in advanced care planning in the preoperative setting. And so I put here as a bullet point the surgeon's role because um, this is an approach the American College of Surgeons is endorsing and um, something that Dr. Cooper's presentation will offer um, as well. To thank the Aging Initiative again for their support, the Pepper Center, as well as um, the HCSRN group, HAMP group for their support, and um, excited and looking forward to continuing um, my work with uh, the collaborators listed here. Um, the experience has truly been rewarding, so thank you. And then here um, is my contact information. Okay. Um, we'll be transitioning the presenter role over uh, to Dr. Cooper. So we'll just give a second to share her screen um, and make sure that everyone can hear her. I'm going to head and unmute her. This is Zara. Um, I thank you all for the opportunity to present. I have to say that about Two seconds ago, right before Vicky transitioned, my computer screen just went blank. I have no idea why, so I'm trying to. I don't. You can see my computer screen. Is it? Can you? It? Because now my computer screen is not logged in, so I apologize for this technical difficulty. It just um, about two minutes ago it just stopped. So I need a few minutes to get um, back on. If I'm not on, I'm see. your screen. Yeah. Okay. So if you want to just put me on mute again and just give me a few minutes, I'm sorry for this. It, it just happened suddenly and I'm not sure what the problem is. Sure. And I do have a copy of the uh, slides. If, if we can't figure out the issue on your end, I can present. Um, okay. We might uh, want to do that. Okay. Um, and I'll just have to tell you in advance because I can't see what you can see. And I, again, I really apologize for this. I don't know what just happened. Problem. Uh, let me just pull up the slides here. Okay. And Heather, maybe I'll, I'll take this moment to remind people that if they do have questions for either of our presenters, if you can submit your questions through the Q&A function, um, I will be monitoring those. Um, and after Dr. Cooper speaks, i um, be happy to relay questions um, to our speakers, um, and they can provide answers. And I can now see uh, Cooper's slides. Um, uh, I realize that you you probably still can't see anything, Zara, but hopefully. I can, yeah, I can see my slides, so I just can't. I just Great. don't know exactly what you can see. So, um, if okay. we, I'll just I'll just tell you to forward, and, and we'll go from there, right? And we'll we'll improvise. Um, so, and appreciate right. the flexibility. So, and thank you all for the opportunity. 
uh, to present. I really appreciate it. Um, this uh, presentation is really a summary of work done by myself and my colleague, colleague Greg Schwarzy, who is at the University of Wisconsin, um, and a number of others. Um, and it really is intended to be a starting point for discussion to help at least help Gretchen and I who are both surgeons and, and those of you who are not surgeons really understand um, kind of way that uh, perioperative communication between surgeons and patients uh, goes and how it affects uh, advanced care planning and end-of-life care. Um, so go to the, the first slide. So the factors of the talk today are one, um, describe what is it with you surgeons, and I say that because I, I've had a number of colleagues in, in a variety of settings ask me, you know, what is it with you and why can't you, A, uh, withdraw life-sustaining treatment when um, patients are near death after they've had surgery, and, and B, um, even really broach the, the subject of advanced care planning and end-of-life care with your seriously patients. And as Vicki mentioned, um, you know, there are increasing numbers of older patients who are undergoing high-risk surgery and, and many of them are seriously ill and have a very high risk of mortality in the year after surgery, but certainly in, in the weeks to months after surgery. Um, the specific challenges in communication um, in the perioperative period that we'll talk about, and then we'll also talk about some potential solutions. Next slide. So, um, I think that there are some myths. Uh, next slide, next click. Um, some myths about the surgeon um, was that we're a little barbaric uh, and sometimes uh, overly harsh in our approach to our patients, but I think you know, often that myth of never let the skin be come between you and a diagnosis is really just that. It's, it's historical. Um, there's also concerns that surgeons are, are unduly fixated on 30-day mortality. There are specialties such as transplants and cardiac surgery where uh, surgeons are very rigorously uh, measured on their 30-day mortality. But even so, there has not been, there haven't really been robust data to show that it uh, strongly influences uh, um, surgeons um, respond to withdrawing of life-sustaining treatment uh, for patients who have had surgery. Um, obviously, uh, surgeons are very concerned about our outcomes. We're graded on that. At the same time, uh, it's not necessarily what drives the way that we care of our patients in most cases. Um, oftentimes, uh, there's a myth that we're mo more focused on pathology than pain, and we'll talk about that a little bit because that um, tied into some of the language that we use with patients that can be hard for them to understand. Um, but, in fact, you know, we don't always view death as a failure. Um, the rest of a surgeon is really knowing when not to operate and knowing when uh, your patient should, your patient selection should be a little bit better. Um, and one thing that's really important for older patients in particular is that, you know, for, um, for operative complications, uh, opiate use and opiate overuse is associated with um, delirium, aspiration, and these are complications that um, obviously uh, complicate and prolong post-operative courses, and for that reason, surgeons are often reluctant to use them. Um, I know that that can cause some uh, controversy with our palliative care colleagues. Um, but I think the one thing that I would say, if you could just hit, hit the uh, advance button again, please, um, that, you know, many of us, uh, you know, approaching complex decision-making and helping patients uh, minimize their time near the end of life is, is oftentimes the most rewarding part of our job. Um, next slide, please. So there is something called the surgical covenant, um, and this was actually first described by Tim Buckman, who's also a trauma surgeon. Um, and and what he described was this covenant between surgeons and patients that said, you know, I will not abandon you. I will battle death for you. It is a deeper and stronger commitment than money can buy, and such a commitment is part of my identity as a surgeon. And Dr. Buckman goes on to describe this kind of personal uh, cost that surgeons endure, um, you know, long hours, calls in the middle of the night, times away from friends and family, um, that, that often, um, exceeds that of other medical specialties where uh, surgeons really feel like they are uh, perhaps more personally measured uh, by their patient outcomes than uh, physicians and other specialties. That becomes important because, you know, if your patient outcomes define you as an individual, then you may be more reluctant to um, admit when the rescue effort has failed or to even acknowledge that it's a possibility. And so one of the things that I think is really important to think about for advanced care playing is that, you know, even um, 
even in the best scenarios, uh, advanced care planning rates are not um, particularly high if you look at national samples. Um, and the way that I think about it oftentimes is that we can have a really hard time getting people to plan for retirement, which is supposed to be fun. Um, but we often have this expectation that, that people will be very, uh, that patients will be willing and enthusiastic about participating in advanced care planning. Um, we know that that's not true, and when the surgeon is equally, equally or more reluctant, um, obviously it's not going to happen. So, Vicki, I commend you for your work. I think it was a really nice presentation and some really interesting findings. I was actually surprised that as many as 26% had some advanced care planning before surgery, so I actually found that very heartening. Uh, slide, please. I described uh, the relationship between patients and surgeons as a contract, and actually, if you look at this picture that I hope, hope you can see, I actually borrowed it from a mortgage ad from Google. And, you know, part of it is because when the surgeon meets the patient for the first time, uh, and the patient meets the surgeon for the first time, um, you know, it's often like speed dating. Um, you know, immediately they're, both parties are deeply invested in putting their best foot forward. The surgeon wants to convince the patient that they are confident, um, that they don't have uncertainty, um, and that uh, they can be trusted. Uh, and the patient also wants to uh, impress the surgeon that they're a good patient, that they'll be adherent, um, because there is this um, kind of, uh, relationship once a patient has surgery or undergoes anesthesia and undergoes surgery, they don't have a personal agency like they do with other medical treatments. So if an internist gives a patient a, a, a prescription for an antihypertensive, the patient can take that prescription and then decide to take it to fill it or not, you know, or even if the, the internist calls it in, they can decide that they won't go and pick it up. Whereas the patient, once the patient decides that they're going to have surgery, once they have surgery, they have to have this kind of immutable trust in their surgeon. Um, it's in their best interest to do so, and so everybody's trying to impress each other. Um, one of the other um, challenges is that, you know, the way that, that surgery is still practiced is that it's not as multidisciplinary as it should be. And obviously, with old patients and with complex um, older patients with multiple medical comorbidities, we know that they benefit from multidisciplinary care. However, individual surgeons are still held accountable for their outcomes, and so um, they are, you know, the captain of the ship. Uh, as I mentioned, there's grief and shame in bad outcomes. Um, why did you operate or why didn't you operate? You know, the surgeon takes the fall, and so often they want to have total control. So that some of the work that we've done has shown that even if those advanced care planning conversations do happen, either with palliative care clinicians or with internists in other clinical settings, the surgeon won't necessarily honor them um, because they think that the situation changed because the patient has agreed to undergo surgery. Um, and we know that there are issues around uh, required reconsideration, around uh, do not resuscitate orders uh, around the time of surgery. Uh, but I think more globally, um, there's an assumption that if a patient uh, is interested in surgery and has agreed to surgery, uh, they really don't just have any limits on, on what, what kind of life-sustaining treatments they would want. Next slide, please. So, you know, one of, one of these concepts that has been described by my colleague Gretchen Schwarzy that I think is really um, informative here is called surgical buy-in. And, and basically um, what this means is that when, uh, let's presume that when a patient has agreed to undergo surgery, as I was just describing, that they have agreed to um, do everything that's necessary to achieve the best possible outcome. Um, and so, uh, in establishing buy-in, surgeons often think um, this is a package deal, this is what an operation entails. Um, attributors to this are that surgeons don't want to be the agent that kills somebody in the operating room. So again, they're very reluctant um, to um, admit that the rescue effort has failed, acknowledge very severe complications, or talk about withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment um, because they feel like they have a personal hand in the patient's demise and are unwilling to, to acknowledge that. The consequences of buy-in, the negative consequences of buy-in are that, you know, even if um, families wish that a, a surgeon um, would withdraw life-sustaining treatment, um, they're reluctant to do it if they think that the patient can survive the operation because that's what was agreed to before surgery. So one of the things that's so important in looking at perioperative communication is to understand the impact that that preoperative conversation has on all of the care that's delivered thereafter. Um, that there's um, not often a lot of wiggle room um, after the fact to kind of reconsider. Obviously, this is a huge um, threat to uh, patient and family autonomy. 
um, and has a lot of ethical issues um, to it. But, you know, at least as surgical culture stands right now, um, that's part of where the communication conflict can arise. So having, um, you know, advanced care planning in place can be very helpful that helps patients and surgeons understand and um, what the patient's overall goals are and um, what patients are willing um, to, to tell them what outcomes are acceptable to them um, up front and can avoid them receiving treatments that they don't necessarily want. Next slide, please. So in talking about some of the challenges of communication, I think, you know, we've done some work where we've really audio recorded hundreds and hundreds of conversations. Uh, Gretchen has led, led this work and we've done um, qualitative analyses of these, and it's really a very um, robust structure of how these conversations go. And, you know, the conversations that I'm talking about are the patient comes to the surgeon, they come, maybe they come accompanied with a caregiver or family member, they come to meet the surgeon, um, immediately there's a discussion about surgery, they've been referred by their internist or specialist, there's an understanding that the patient is interested in surgery, um, the patient, uh, I'm sorry, the surgeon then kind of explains what's going on. Um, in the explanatory phase, they do a description of the disease process, um, and then the surgeon talks about a proposed operative intervention. Um, that's followed by a deliberative phase where the surgeon kind of thinks out loud as to what's the rationale for choosing or not choosing surgery, and then it immediately goes into informed consent. And you'll see that there's some, uh, some key things that are missing here, which is, you know, understanding the patient's overall health goals, a discussion about the risks and benefits of surgery, I should say the risks and burdens of surgery as they relate to longevity, quality of life, um, you know, independence, functional independence, and the impact of surgery on other medical comorbidities. Um, and really a recommendation. There's like a rationale for choosing surgery or not choosing surgery, but there's not really a recommendation in the context of the patient's goals. Um, and so we'll talk about that some more, but those are some glaring omissions that really contribute to um, surgical care that is really disease focused and not necessarily person or patient focused. Next page, please. You know, one of these, these um, studies that we did was we, in uh, analyzing um, interviews between older, uh, seriously high-risk surgical patients and their surgeons, we found that surgeons are very, um, are very frequently use um, uh, language and phrases that make patients and their families feel like, like the surgery is done, things will return to normal. So, you know, in describing an anatomic problem, we'll use terms like it's blocked, it's leaky, it's broken, it's jumbled, um, or we use images, CT scans, x-rays to show what the problem is. Um, and we often use analogies that we think patients and families can understand. You know, broken trees, bruised fruit, um, you know, rotten, something is rotten or it's rotted. Um, and when we talk about fixing it, we use kind of very mechanical language. We'll bypass it, we'll replace it, we'll remove it, we'll construct it, we'll build it, we'll tip, we'll loose it, loosen it. And all of this language really leads patients, one, to be very focused on the technical aspects of surgery as opposed to um, the overall uh, goals of what surgery can accomplish, um, but also is very fixated on an anatomic problem and, and doesn't necessarily allow us to pull back and think about the larger global impact of surgery. Next, please. Another thing we found is when surgeons uh, deliberations, um, we don't really have great language for describing the gravity of the surgery. And, and one of the things that I think is so, so important to recognize is that, that it looked at, um, you know, how Vicki described high-risk surgery, which is how we describe high-risk surgery, which is surgery where the risk of mortality is 1%. That's actually not um, very high. So many times people think that um, you know, older patients uh, in particular, they think that they're going to die on the table. That's not how they're going to die um, after surgery. I mean, in most cases, we can get people off the operating table. So they, they kind of mistakenly think that, well, the worst that can happen is that they'll have a peaceful death during surgery. But in case that's not what we as, as clinicians are most worried about, and that's not what most of them experience if they do die in the perioperative period. Uh, again, we don't have great language to talk about risk, and so we say things like it's you know, big surgery. So, um, you know, we use phrases like, um, you know, if we decide we're going to be there, then you have a sort of 
sort of verbal contract that we're going to do everything we have we have to to achieve the outcome that we want. So we're going to go forward with that, and then we have the understanding that everybody is going to do their utmost. So you know, there's this understanding between the patient and the surgeon that they're all in it. We all use these war analogies. They, you know, we're we're going into battle and we're going to do whatever we need to do to get out. You know, this is a war. We're going to fight it. Um, and oftentimes that leaves the patient saying things like, you know, I have complete faith in you, um, you do what you have to do. Next slide, please. Um, and so uh, patients are kind of left feeling like they're completely beholden to their surgeon uh, because they're at very high risk. So I'll give an example here. Uh, slide, please. Uh, this is a patient uh, named Ramon. This is a, a based on, on a patient of mine, actually. The 71-year-old man who had advanced lung cancer, um, he was undergoing um, palliative chemotherapy. He was actually on his second uh, round of chemotherapy and was on high-dose steroids. And he presented um, to the emergency department with a perforated diverticulitis. By him, he was in septic shock. Um, he was clean extremis. He was very uh, hypotensive, and he was tachycardic. You know, conversations in this situation can go one of two ways. Next slide, please. Um, they can go like this, where we say that we're going to, you know, if you don't have surgery, you're going to die, um, that it's a big operation, that we're going to fix the problem, um, and that you've got to be in for the fight. Or, next slide, please, you can see you know, what outcomes are most important to you. And that's a really important distinction because given the choice, this is a man who is obviously critically ill. He has a terminal life-threatening illness. Um, you know, he uh, is elderly. He's got advanced cancer with a life expectancy that's measured in weeks to months at baseline. Now he has an acute surgical emergency with a perforated diverticulitis sepsis. That's what we can expect for him is that even if we're able to fix I just use quotes for emphasis, emphasis, even if we're able to fix by gram patching the hole that's, that's in his stomach, I'm sorry, uh, the hole that's in his stomach or to remove part of his colon and do a colostomy, we still have to deal with the sequelae of the fact that he's sepsis, he'll be on a ventilator because he's got advanced lung cancer, um, he's going to have to be in intensive care, he's going to become progressively weak, that it's unlikely that he'll gain functional independence and highly unlikely that he'll ever get back to chemotherapy. The alternative is that we can ask him what, what outcomes are most important to him and try to figure out how to, um, how to assess whether or not surgery fits in with those goals. Um, what I'll say is that in having these conversations, I don't think that in asking patients what outcomes are most important to them, that they're less likely to choose surgery. I, I don't think that that's necessarily the case at all. But I think what it can avoid is a slippery slope of unwanted treatments, and I think what it can do is help us all focus on what's most important to the patient, make sure that we deliver the most appropriate care throughout the perioperative period. Next slide, please. But that, you know, is really hard for a number of reasons. And I think, you know, they, um, again, brought up a really good point that, you know, a lot of these conversations will happen in the clinical setting, advanced care planning conversations will happen in the clinical setting. Um, that's challenging for surgeons for the reasons that I mentioned earlier, that oftentimes we're meeting patients for the first time and making decisions for treatment. So we have to, you know, have goals of care conversations. We have to make um, surgical decisions. We have to make uh, treatment recommendations. We need to break bad news, which are all complex communication tasks, and we need to do that all in one setting. Um, there's also, you know, with respect to surgery, there's also, also patient factors. Patients often have a poor understanding of their chronic illness, and so, you know, many of those patients, I would submit, who uh, died in the year after surgery didn't necessarily have an understanding of their prognosis before they got to, to the surgeon. Um, and surgeons aren't necessarily equipped to understand um, their prognosis outside of their surgical illness. So, for example, if you have somebody who has chronic COPD, who has chronic congestive heart failure, um, advanced diabetes with chronic kidney injury, and they also happen to have, you know, let's say it's a 75-year-old obese man who also happened to have a, a six-centimeter triple-A, um, the surgeon doesn't necessarily understand what that man's prognosis is outside of um, the risk of rupture from his AAA. Now, in order for his AAA repair to actually provide him survival benefit, he needs to live at least two to three years. The surgeon isn't necessarily going to know that. Uh, again, uh, I think this speaks for the need for multidisciplinary care from a number of levels. 
The other issues that are important are, you know, patient and, I'm sorry, surrogate and family factors. Oftentimes, surrogates and families have poor understanding of patient's um, illness. Uh, they're not prepared. Um, and obviously, there's a certain amount of uncertainty that's involved in any of these decisions. And so, um, it's really important that we help patients and families understand uncertainty, but oftentimes, we don't understand that ourselves. There are some factors that are involved. As I mentioned, some of the personal and cultural values around mortality and end-of-life care, um, personal feelings about death, uh, death, scale and comfort and serious illness communication and doing advanced care planning. Uh, I can tell you that, that from a, a national level, uh, you know, skill training and care planning is, is really inadequate. Um, oftentimes, surgeons don't have a prior relationship with the patient, so the first thing, they don't want advanced care planning <laughs> to be the first thing that they talk about. Um, and that, that there are challenges with um, obtaining advanced directives when they exist. Um, then there are system factors, including fragmented information. Um, if you're dealing with patients who are not necessarily always receiving their care in your health system, it can be hard to get the information. And then obviously, particularly if you're not particularly comfortable or skilled at these conversations, it's often a worry that they take up a lot of time and a lot of resources, which isn't necessarily true, um, but is certainly a perceptual barrier to have surgeons conduct these conversations. Next slide, please. So this is um, looking at patients like Ramon. I, I want to help understand what his one-year mortality is and kind of explain why it is so important as Vicky did surgeons to understand advanced care planning and to engage in this. Um, so patients like Ramon, um, we um, wanted to figure out what the one-year mortality was, and we used uh, data from the Health and Retirement Study to identify older patients who underwent um, exploratory laparotomy on an emergency basis. Um, if you look here at this first survival cur curve, we stratified patients uh, into three different age groups. The first was 65 to 74. And here on the uh, y-axis is the percentage of patients who died, and then on the x-axis you have the number of days. And you can see that a year, 23% uh, of patients 65 to 74 have died. Uh, next slide. Uh, and for older patients who are 75 to 84, at a year, 35% of them have died. And then, of course, patients who are over the age of 85, uh, next slide, please, 50% uh, of patients have died at one year. And so if you look at that, that has um, a mortality rate that exceeds many cancers um, where, you know, advanced care planning uh, at earlier stages is considered standard of care or certainly a goal of high-value care. Um, whereas in surgery, we haven't really been held to the same, the same measures. I think other things that I think are important to look at here is that if you look at um, the difference between 30 and 180 day mortality, um, you see that although uh, there's a significant decline in survival at before 30 days, uh, that decline continues up until 180 days. So what does this mean? It means that there's high residual mortality for these patients uh, in the weeks after they leave the hospital which also emphasizes the importance for advanced care planning. And of course, given um, high expected mortality in patients who are 85 and older, um, it's fair to say that, that hospice should be discussed um, with a few of them. Next slide, please. And next slide again. I think one of the challenges is that surgeons, as I mentioned, are not necessarily great at prognosis. So these are some structured interviews that we did um, with acute care surgeons, with a national sample of 24 acute care surgeons, and we actually presented the same scenario to them that I just described to you about this patient, Ramon. And we asked them, um, what do you think his probability of death is within 72 hours if he does not have an operation? So asking them about that question, you know, will he die, um, will he die with, without an operation? And what would you tell the family? And what you see here is that there's a tremendous amount of variability. On the walks, you have the percent um, survival, expected survival, and then on the x-axis you have um, each participant. And what you can see is that this is kind of all over the place. So you know, the prognosis that you get really depends on who's on call that night. Um, the information that you get from your surgeon, which is a little scary. Next slide, please. We also asked them what thought his expected length of survival would be, even if an operation is performed. And again, you can see here that the, um, there's a tremendous amount of variability. However, most of the surgeons thought that his survival would be in the month to range, you know, in the less than six month range. Next slide, please. And so I think what's important to recognize here, again, is that the majority of surgeons thought that this is somebody who would be eligible for hospice. Again, um, 
emphasizing the need for advanced care planning and surgery. So potential solutions. So next slide, please. Potential solutions. Uh, slide, please. So I think one of the things that we also learned from um, our qualitative interviews or semi-structured interviews with the acute care surgeons was that they um, were wrought with the uncertainty about the outcome. Um, and it made many of them feel obligated to recommend surgery, um, even if um, the patient and family uh, demonstrate some reluctance. Uh, they said that they would actually take a patient like Ramon into the OR. Uh, next, next slide, please. And so, next slide again. Um, one of the things they said is that if you don't have some kind of framework about how aggressive the family and or patient would want to be, and don't have that conversation on the front end, it becomes a very slippery slope that continues on and sometimes prolongs the dying process. Next slide. So, we actually convened a multidisciplinary advisory panel of experts in surgical oncology, emergency surgery, vascular surgery, palliative care, geriatrics, anesthesia emergency medicine and other relevant specialties uh, to help us develop a framework to make recommendations about best communication practices in these high-stakes scenarios. Um, our purpose was to create a communication tool for surgeons uh, to facilitate gold concordant treatment. Next slide. There were savers that we thought were really important that we needed to emphasize as part of this. Um, uh, and many of this is, you know, serious illness communication that I think is very familiar to geriatricians but is not necessarily as familiar to surgeons. Um, so, allowing for silence, pause points, uh, verbal acknowledgement of emotions, um, sitting, making contact, making physical contact with the patient, asking the patient and family to summarize, and also asking permission to move on to the next part of the conversation. I think if you go back to that diagram that I showed much earlier, that, that really showed the structure of, of current surgical conversations. Much of this is missing. There's not a lot of time. It's a very linear conversation, and there's actually not a lot of uh, room there for back and forth between the patient and the surgeon. Next slide, please. The framework looks like this. Um, and so uh, the steps that we included were, one, to connect, introduce yourself, gather data, and make a personal connection. I know that seems very obvious, but we know that over 50% of the time, clinicians don't introduce themselves to patients and families. Uh, the step is to uh, establish a shared understanding of the patient's current condition um, to explore their understanding of their illness. Again, uh, it's important to understand where the patient thinks they are in their illness trajectory um, and use that as an opportunity um, to confirm or correct. A uh, step is to inform, so disclosing information about the acute problem. And this is where surgeons are really very comfortable um, in talking about the surgical problem that they can fix or not fix. Um, but also to then understand in the patient's goals and priorities and discuss trade-offs. And this is somewhere where we could use more work and uh, ties into the findings of uh, Vicki's advanced care planning study. And this would be to describe the options, the benefits, the burdens, and the likely outcomes of surgical and non-surgical options. I think one of the challenges is that, it, again, going back to that diagram, is that we go straight into informed consent. Um, although part of informed consent is discussing non-surgical options, too often surgeons will say, you know, we can do surgery or we can do nothing. Uh, and we all know that nothing is not an alternative that many patients and families are willing to accept. And so surgeons need to become better educated about what the alternative medical treatments might be, particularly for palliative operations. Um, and then they need to recommend a course of treatment in the context of the patient goals. So one of, one of the challenges here is that we can then the course of treatment if, if we take the example that I just had of the rep of the uh, AAA, you know, I think it, 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 surgery for that patient is indicated, but it's not necessarily appropriate and it's not necessarily going to help him achieve his goals. Um, and so I think a surgeon needs to take all of those things into consideration. Uh, and then the next step would be to support um, and affirm the relationship and support the patient's decision, whether it's for surgery or not, meant to communicate uh, and document the conversation and discuss with the clinical team. As I will say that we just did a study um, that was published in the Journal of Otomology uh, looking at advanced care planning for patients who are having a salvage laryngectomy. So these are patients with advanced head and neck cancer who will not be able uh, to speak again. We know they won't be able to speak again. And so, um, you know, that visit is really an opportune time for uh, advanced care planning where the patient will be able to speak in their own voice. Uh, you know, we found that the um, frequency of advanced care planning for those patients was below 20%. Um, 
to tell what was documented and what I can say from you know, knowing the surgeons who whose records we reviewed, um, you know, once they saw the study, they were really surprised by the data um, because they feel like they do it more often than that. And so I think getting uh, our clinicians to document um, is really, really important. Next slide, please. If we were to use this framework, I think that a conversation with Ramon would be very different than we can do big surgery, fix your problem, we're going into battle, and you fight this thing. Um, and instead, the surgeon could ask questions like, what have these past few months been like? Um, we've hit a bad problem. And what I'm hearing is that, you know, you've been declining over the past few months. It's been getting harder for you to breathe. Um, you know, we've been changing chemotherapy, and there has still been progression of your cancer. Um, you know, you Imagine that the patient and their family might have a very emotional response to that. Um, it would be important for the surgeon to acknowledge that emotion as opposed to just blowing through it, which is often what, what physicians do. Um, at that point, it would be important for the surgeon to describe what the uh, likely options are or the likely outcomes are. Here's what I think is likely to happen in either case. Um, an important ask, you know, again, for the advanced care planning piece, if you get sicker, what are the things that you would want to avoid? Um, you know, what, what are the trade-offs that you would be willing to make for the outcomes that we think are most likely? And then for the surgeon to make a recommendation and then to emphasize uh, his or her uh, commitment and not abandonment of the patient. Next slide, please. So we did, um, did uh, some assimilated uh, patients. We did some similar cases with uh, acute care surgeons using this framework. We just described the framework to them very briefly for about 10 minutes and then gave them the framework to use. Um, and we then audio taped the conversations. Uh, next slide, please. And what we did, as I mentioned, was that the surgeons really were great at informing, uh, informing uh, the patient about uh, the acute problem and then describing uh, the options. However, they weren't so great, next slide, please, about doing the things that patients value, which is exploring illness understanding, uh, understanding the patient's goals and priorities, making recommendations, and then affirming their support. Next slide, please. So we also um, did work um, using a patient and family advisory council. We did an observational study of 91 interviews um, before and after surgery. Um, and uh, then our data uh, to the PFAC. We actually did a uh, qualitative analysis and then brought the results of our analysis to our patient and family advisory council. Patient and family advisory councils were comprised of of um, older patients who had had high-risk surgery and uh, some family members of older patients who had ha had high-risk surgery. And really what they heard um, when they understood the, the conversations between the patients and, and the uh, surgeons was that, you know, really, as I described, surgery was the only option, um, that the patients were unprepared for surgery, that they didn't understand how difficult the recovery would be, um, and that um, there was a disconnect between what patients wanted and who was the right person to tell. Um, and so one of the solutions uh, that we came up with was a question prompt list. And this is actually a PCORI-funded study uh, that's led by my colleague Gretchen Swarzy. I'm the site PI. There are five sites. I'm the fight, site P, uh, PI at Brigham Women's here, um, where we're actually giving um, surgeon, patients, high-risk patients, these question prompt lists before they have their visit with their surgeon. Um, our hope here is that and, and patients can engage in richer, um, more comprehensive conversations that will talk about things other than the technical aspects of surgery. So if you look at what this is what, what the brochure actually looks like. It says, are you talking with a surgeon? Here are some questions that you can ask to help decide what's right for you. And, um, you know, the question is, should I have surgery? What are my options? You know, it is likely to happen if I do have surgery. What if I don't have surgery? In your opinion, will surgery make me feel better? Uh, that's a really important point because oftentimes we don't actually talk to patients about what their experience will be like after the operation. In your opinion, will surgery help me live longer? If so, how much longer? The middle is what should I expect if everything goes well? I think my daily life will look after the surgery, right? After the surgery in months, weeks, a year. Uh, see, at the end, after I leave the hospital, what type of care do you think I will need? And that was what happens if things go wrong after surgery. Can you describe some serious complications and what those might mean for me. If I get to appoint someone to make medical decisions for me, what do I need to make those 
arrangements official. Um, so some very pragmatic, practical information that can help um, provide some structure uh, to preoperative uh, conversations and advanced care planning. Next slide, please. Um, and just kind of this just kind of uh, describes the question prompt list for patients by patients again. And next slide, please. So summary, you know, I hope that I've described that you know there are some real challenges that we have with perioperative communication. Uh, that are real barriers to advanced care planning. I think that there are some pretty straightforward um, solutions that we can do that will help um, better age uh, and prompt uh, patients to be a more active part of the conversation. Uh, I think surgeons do want to uh, do better at these conversations. They don't necessarily have the tools to do so, and so more education and uh, better incorporation of advanced care planning into the surgical workflow is critical. Um, and I think that the, the more uh, that we take care of older, seriously ill patients, uh, the more engaged surgeons will become. So thank you very much, and thank you for improvising with me. I hope everybody was able to follow along and that we we're all looking at the same things, and I apologize again for the technical difficulty. No problem whatever with the technical difficulty. Um, this is Heather Whitson, and I am uh, looking at the um, questions and answers Oh, we some. Um, sorry, let me just get my, my screens up. Um, oh, and about um, getting a copy of the slides, um, and um, it, uh, for people who would like a copy of the slides, you can email um, Valentina. Um, and you should have um, her email address. Uh, here's a question that says, um, do you have conversations about the suspension of DNR orders prior to surgery? I'm guessing that's a question for me. So, um, honestly, I personally do. Um, I'm a palliative care trained, so yes, I do. I, so, there is a, a, a complete myth out there that, um, you know, DNR is automatically reversed for the operation. Uh, that is absolutely not true. Jake always is against it. The American Association, uh, I'm sorry, the American Society of Anesthesiologists and the American College of Surgeons both have very strong position statements about uh, the process of required reconsideration, which means that if somebody has a DNR, um, that it is incumbent upon the surgeon and the anesthesiologist uh, to address the fact that they have an, a DNR, to discuss the implications of reversal or keeping the DNR, um, and then if they decide to reverse the DNR, to have very strict um, or very clear um, uh, parameters around when the DNR will be reinstated and under what, what circumstances. Um, you know, we have found in our own institution that, that adherence to that is abysmally low. Um, I think, again, most surgeons and anesthesiologists aren't necessarily comfortable having those conversations. Uh, at the same time, I do think that there's a misunderstanding that if a patient has agreed to surgery, then, you know, um, oddly they want their DNR re reversed. I, obviously, I don't think that that's true, but I think that's a huge uh, misunderstanding that we need to clarify within the clinical community. Um, so I'm doing a lot of work at our institution to educate surgeons and anesthesiologists around that. Um, we're actually doing some simulations, um, educational simulations with, our, with anesthesia residents, uh, specifically around uh, this type of communication. But nationally, it's a huge problem because, as I said, there's a huge myth and misunderstanding that that it needs to be automatically reversed. Okay, I do have another question, um, which is uh, or a request. Please share any strategies that are being used to proactively engage older adults in their advanced care planning prior to surgery. Um, is advanced care planning being offered through WebEx classes, brief one-on-one -on -one conversations? What's the format? If you want to address that. Yeah, great. Thanks. I just learned how to unmute myself. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for that question. Um, so I think there are several ways. So with the Coalition for Quality in Geriatric Surgery, one of our tasks is to develop educational material for all um, patients, providers, and surgeons. And then, of course, um, the thing with um, the question prompt list that is accessible um, uh, online 
um, you can get that. One that we use in clinic is the uh, Prepare for Your Care website, which is primarily geared for uh, patients that are 65 and older um, with uh, chronic uh, illnesses in which they can go through scenarios and have um, video examples. And so these are all kind of tools that are uh, being used um, uh, to engage the different stakeholders in learning how to do advanced care planning as well as um, promoting um, advanced care planning prior to surgery. Um, I think um, one thing that I'm going to mention um, that is so important uh, that Sarah brought up is that this needs to be um, effort on all, and so it's not just the surgeons getting educated with, you know, tools to this, but also to have the, you know, um, usually the primary care provider or um, some other sort of internal medicine uh, discipline um, prior to referring to surgery if they, there hasn't been an advanced care planning discussion to prompt the patient, like, and engage them to have that conversation so that they're more equipped to, to um, engage their surgeon in this conversation and then also bring to the table what they um, find is important in their life as well. Thank you. Um, and another question that has come in is, um, the, it's sort of the problem with discussion of competing risks is having data that supports the thought process. Not all surgeons may have all the data, as you showed, by KM curves. Thoughts on how to address that problem? Your question, I think it's really important. So, you know, uh, uh, there's really a lot of medicine is a data-free zone. I think one of the challenges with surgery is that, our, our, you know, I think surgeons, clin our clinicians, and patients all have uh, this expectation that surgery is a particularly data-rich zone, and it's not. Um, and I think one of the important points is helping uh, and patients and family members hold uncertainty. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen. And even if we have all the data, so I have data with those KM curves. And 50% of the time, if you're over 85, you'll be dead in a year. And 50% of the time, you won't. Um, you know, I don't know what that really tells you um, in the absence of patients' goals and values and what's important to them. Um, you know, that number alone isn't particularly formative. And so I think that we as a community need to have a better understanding of how to deal with the data that we do have, and then also when we don't have data, um, help patients uh, and clinicians manage the uncertainty around that data. I think if, if you really can focus on the patient's goals and values and what outcomes are most acceptable to them, um, that's probably the best data that we have for what's right for that individual patient. A question. Yeah, I think I, I, I think embracing uncertainty, or at least acknowledging uncertainty, is 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 um, would, what would help in many facets right. of medicine. You know, and I, and I say, but that being said, you know, one of the particular challenges in surgery, and I don't think this is unique to surgery, but but I think one of the challenges for surgeons again is this: you know, you're meeting the patient, you want to demonstrate that you're confident, you want to demonstrate that you're competent, and so you know, it's very hard to open with. And I don't know what's going to happen, and let's talk about if things go wrong. wrong. Um, yeah. So it does create create this kind of expectation and false dichotomy. Forgive me, I'm not being very articulate today, but you know, it, it sets up, you know, this this um, you know false expectation that you know this is a data rich zone where we know what's going to happen and everything's going to be okay. And yet, anecdotally, I feel like I've heard a lot of patients say when they speak to me about another provider that they really like, appreciated, they'll say, I really appreciated the fact that he or she told me when they didn't know something. Right, right, told absolutely. Told me that they weren't sure what was going to happen. Yeah. Absolutely. And we have data to support that, actually. I mean, there's there's data, um, you know, particularly in in communicating prognosis to patients that they, they prefer to know if there's uncertainty. And they they prefer to know that their clinicians are being honest with them about what they know and they don't know. Um, so I think your experience is, is, is evidence-based. So, so I do have um, more questions for you here. So um, this one says, thanks very much to these expert presenters. Um, I am wondering how you would envision improvements being made to encourage or ease these conversations between patients and surgeons. Does there need to be better conversations about death and advanced care planning in broader contexts? 
make that. I'm happy to if you can repeat that for me, Dr. Woodson. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. No problem, no problem. They say um, that they're wondering how you could uh, envision improvements being made to encourage or ease these conversations between patients and surgeons, and if perhaps um, there need better conversations about death and advanced care planning in broader contexts, um, such as they say public health efforts um, for advanced care planning that might then make the conversation easier but for surgeons. Yeah, I definitely appreciate that. And I, I think that's absolutely correct, that there needs to be a public health um, stance in saying that advanced care planning needs to happen, not just, you know, cross surgery, but in general in life. It's kind of like how Zara says, like, you know, we have to prepare for retirement, right? <laughs> it's just the same kind of concept. Um, and so the thing about surgery that's in particular is that the patient is going to have life-changing um, things happen to them after surgery. And so this is a very opportune time to engage patients in advanced care planning. And then also it's, it's important to, because of these potential life changes that may occur after surgery. Um, and so, so absolutely agree, it needs to be a public health stance. I think um, the work that uh, Zara and Gretchen and the group, that group has been doing in terms of helping surgeons have the tools that they need and the skills um, to have these advanced care planning uh, discussions is all very important in um, our, this multi-pronged approach to improve advanced care planning prior to surgery. Um, so besides, you know, the work that Gretchen and um, are, are doing, and then if we can have some sort of public health campaign with that, but also having um, uh, you know, the, the refer again, like the primary care provider, the person that knows, you know, the patient for many, many years prior to to engage them in that advanced care planning discussion prompt to going to the surgeon, prompt, you know, having the patient all be prompted with these, you know, knowing what's important to them, and and then having them engage with the sin will make it that much easier to have this conversation. Great. Um, and I have two more questions, um, and I think that these are both um, to Dr. Cooper, um, and they're not really related, but they're, I think they're both, um, well, it may be brief. I'm just going to give them both to you. Um, the first one is if you can speak about um, your experience um, and maybe particularly any work um, that you've done on this topic in patients with MSK issues. It says spinal deformities, mm. revenge joints, and fractures. And other very specific question is, um, can you tell us the extent of training on shared decision-making communication that a surgeon would receive, particularly when it comes to high-risk operations and frail patients? So, uh, so I'll take I'll take the second question first. I, I, so, the extent of training is very. So, the board of surgery includes palliative care and communication uh, as part of core competencies, um, and Almost all surgical residencies use something uh, called a curriculum called SCORE that is uh, put out by the American Board of Surgery that includes modules on palliative care, ethics, shared decision making, and communication. Um, that being said, I, I don't think that this is stuff that, that you can read uh, alone. And so um, the remainder of the training that they receive, specifically kind of the hands on simulation, um, modeling, um, that kind of thing is very site dependent. And so um, it, de it depends on the surgeons with whom they work. It also depends on the presence of geri geriatrics and palliative care in their medical center. Um, there's really not a lot of uniform training. One of the really exciting things that Vicki is doing is she's working with the American College of Surgeons and with the Coalition for Quality and Geriatric Surgery. Um, they're coming out with standards for geriatric surgical care in 2019. Um, and uh, Vicki and I have worked together to um, develop the decision-making uh, and communication standards around deliberations for surgery. Um, and we've developed some education modules and education programs, which also involve simulation and role play um, for surgeons. You know, implementing those broadly is a huge challenge. And so um, we have a very long way to go before, you know, surgeons receiving um, 
you know, communication training becomes, you know, standard throughout, but um, there is some work being done. Uh, specifically for patients who have MSK issues, uh, I guess I, I'm not entirely sure which patient population you're to which you're referring. Um, I think for patients who have multiple comorbidities, um, you know, in our institution we do have a geriatrician um, a C selected patients um, who are uh, candidates for for orthopedic surgery specifically around spinal. Um, surgery and joint replacement um, to help engage and share decision making and advanced care planning. Um, again, that's that's our site, and that that's not really um, really uniform across hospitals. I hope that answered the question. Yes, the question, and um, if if uh, the questioner wants um, more, feel free to um, use the Q&A function again. I think that we have worked our way through the questions, at least the ones that. That I am seeing right now. Um, I'll do sort of last call if there's anyone else that has a, a question. Um, while we just give the opportunity for that, um, you know, a question that I had was just, I mean, to me, it seems like that one of the most, one of the biggest obstacles, and you've both alluded to this, is is the time um, that it takes really. really Engage in in these conversations um, in, a, in a meaningful way. In some ways, it's easier to stand at the doorway and say, "Okay, we're going to fight," <laughs> and 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 leave. Um, and and I don't mean to be flippant when I say that. I, I think that um, you know most of the surgeons that I know are in the hospital all the time, um, but they're spending large swaths of the day um, in the OR, um, and so. Less time, maybe, just to have these conversations, whether it's in clinic or in, in patients at the hospital bed. So, I wonder about thoughts that you all have about um, sort of um, aging other disciplines, so co management with palliative care or geriatrics, um, or um, involvement of um, other providers, um, whether it's nursing clubs or, or other providers, um, to have some of these conversations. I mean that that it, uh, the physicians need to be trained in these tools so that they can have these conversations effectively when they do, but they also may not. Patients may be had more if we equip additional people besides the surgeon to have these conversations. I can I can start with that. I I would say that so the first. Study I did around this actually was in our preoperative testing center, and uh, it, it was a small kind of randomized control pilot study uh, of having a a, uh, a care trained facilitator in the preoperative testing center um, to discuss advanced care planning with patients who were um, listed as going as expected to go to the ICU after surgery. And what I will say is that. Um, it's very hard to engage patients um, side of a visit with their surgeon. Um, and even the patients who participated said that they would have preferred to have these conversations with their surgeon. Um, so I think that there is a bit of a, a challenge in getting patients um, excited about having these conversations with, with non-surgical providers, again, because that relationship between the patient and the surgeon is so strong because the patient has to give up total trust. I think the other challenge is that surgeons are also very reluctant to let other be part of the communication um, because, again, they're held accountable for all of the outcomes. Um, and so uh, we have to figure out, I think it's really, really important for us to develop more multidisciplinary approaches to care for these patients because surgeons cannot and absolutely should not be doing all of this by themselves, um, in part because we don't have the expertise, you know, even if we, we all become expert communicators, we don't have the expertise that we need in geriatrics. Um, to really manage all of these patients well ourselves. I mean, I, I, there's certainly a lot of work in the trauma literature and in the uh, orthopedic literature to show that the outcomes are so much better when these patients are managed together um, in a multidisciplinary way. So I, 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 I agree with you, Heather. I think it's really important, but there are major barriers for that, and I think some of that is structural. I think if we could, you know, have financial and structural incentives um, to help um, prompt surgeons and geriatricians to work together, um, uh, efficiently and effectively for these patients, I think it would go a long way. But right now, those 
those prompts, the incentives aren't there. Thank you. So uh, a few things I want to say. So it, I, I definitely commend uh, um, for having done that study. It's one study that I remember reading a few years back and really appreciating. And um, so what's interesting is that we have this pre-op program here at UCSF, and, um, and I'm the geriatrician in the clinic, and I've aligned myself with, um, the clinic has been aligned with the surgeon's office. And it's interesting because we do have these advanced care planning discussions with these patients. And what we do is we couch this, you know, conversation to start off with, you know, your surgeon has referred you to our clinic. You know, we work as a team. It's very, um, the emphasis is that we, we are a team. And so, and I believe that the surgeons um, feel that we, you know, contribute to this advanced care planning discussion. And um, if there are any questions that I would go to them and uh, we would have a group discussion with the patient, the surgeon, and as well as, as a geriatrician, which would be me. And so we've been uh, pretty fruitful in terms of engaging patients in this conversation. I absolutely think that um, patients should have this conversation with surgeons because surgeons provide information as well as um, a, a context that, you know, maybe a primary care provider cannot um, provide in surgical context. And so, but what it does, you know, primary care providers can do as well as other, you know, um, um, disciplines uh, that are not, not surgeons is to engage that patient and to start thinking about the broad, over, you know, what are what's most important to you, right? And so, like, for them to have that in mind prior to seeing the surgeon um, is already one step ahead. Yeah, um, I, I appreciate the comments of, of both of you um, on that point. Um, so we do have, I think I have um, two final questions, and then we'll probably have to wrap up our session for today. Um, and they're both um, about particular content um, in your slides. So the first one is, in the analysis of patient characteristics that were associated with having an advanced directive in their EMR, did you find any relationship between the patient's characteristics and their likelihood or not to take part in advanced care planning via a one-on-one -on -one conversation, a class, or a web-based format? Um, that is one question. And then the other one was, could you please remind us of the pamphlet that was for patients to help them ask questions of their surgeons, and how can we access that? Happy to answer both. So uh, long word of it, no, I didn't look at that. I think that's a good um, thought and something that we should definitely look at. I think in general, um, there has been uh, studies looking specifically at surgery, but just engaging a patient in advanced care planning, um, you know, in general, looking at, you know, whether one one versus um, something like um, prepareforyourcare.org as a, um, a web-based um, approach uh, versus like a group format. Uh, there has been literature done on that. So um, definitely would encourage um, that uh, person that answered that asked that question uh, to look deeply into that. I don't know that off the top of my head. And then for the um, pamphlet with the questions, it's the question prompt list or the PL. And um, maybe Zara can uh, add to this, but my you know what I do is I usually just Google QPL or question prompt list, and then I get the um, the information on that in the toolkit. Thanks so much. And I just want to once again thank both of our presenters today. I was struck by what gifted communicators both of you are, and I'm glad that you've um, taken